Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our PR panel today. We're super excited to have Christine and Erin with us. They're PR experts in their field, and you're going to learn a lot from them. But since this is Marketing Happy Hour, we do just need to know quickly your favorite go-to happy hour drink. Right now, I am obsessed with any kind of a spritz, a Negroni Sbagliato or a yes. limoncello spritz. I feel like Aperol had its moment. I'm moving past it. And right now I'm going for the more niche ones. I was wondering if you were going to say the same answer as me because it is spritz season. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I, is Aperol or Hugo spritz is really my go-to now. I've, I've switched teams. Mm. I love those. Aren't the, is that like St. Germain uh, elderflower? Okay. I love that so much. And there's wow. also now people are doing limoncello spritzes, which is like, oh, I could just have that every single day. <laughs> I am a uh, spritz, major spritz fan. It's hilarious. Like anyone who's listened to this podcast, even a couple of times may know that. Um, and even during the winter, I used to live in New York city, Christine. So even in the winter, I would order a spritz and get heavily made fun of by my friends, but it's okay. <laughs> well, you know, funnily enough, uh, Aperol spritz becoming such a thing here in the U S was a PR campaign. I believe it was by Wonderman Thompson. And they basically mm -hmm. seeded that out in the Hamptons with influencers, <laughs> creators, and making sure it was talked about everywhere. So that was actually a result of PR campaigns is perfect segue to our topic today. Oh my gosh. I love that. Yeah, it's an absolutely perfect segue. So on that, uh, because we are talking about all things PR, I have to know from both of you, just kind of an example of a successful PR campaign you've worked on, whether it's recently or just, uh, you know, in the past and any of your positions you've held, tell us all about those. Sure. So actually for uh, the podcast that I co-host with um, Yanni and Melissa, who are both creatives over at the creative agency TBWH at Day LA, we, when we were launching our podcast this spring, it's called House of Content. You can find it on all the socials at It's House of Content. And we talk about creator economy and viral trends, TikTok, all that good stuff. And so when uh, when we were launching, I thought to myself, you know, I've done PR for a while. And again, right now, or at that time, I was freelancing. So I wasn't really associated associated with any company. So I just decided to put together a little pitch around not just the podcast, but also us as creatives, as advertising professionals. Wow. And I sent it to maybe a half a dozen industry outlets, you know, the ad weeks, the ad ages, the drum. And we got a hit with Muse by Clio and they actually came back to us and asked if we would be, if we, we would like to be part of their five minutes with creatives interview series where they send these really fun, quirky, different um, types of questions. And, you know, I've, a lot of the people in the industry that I really admire, like super high up creative professionals and leaders have been on that series. So I was blown away by the fact that our little, you know, I sent it from our little Gmail and was able to place that story on Muse by Cleo, which has been one of my career bucket lists of, of getting it on. So that's, that's a recent example of successful PR that I've been able to place in the industry media. Oh my goodness. I love that. In my role for press PR and marketing, I lead PR for Outback Steakhouse. Uh, and so Lead PR nationally, they just had a launch for their new Sweet Heat season menu on July 26th, um, but the PR for that started months in advance uh, before anyone knew about it or could enjoy it in restaurant. Um, we were setting up tastings all across the U.S. with media friends, new and old. We were setting up interviews to talk about how hot honey is just a trend taking over the food and beverage industry right now. We all have a taste for that, um, and it was really exciting to see that uh, once that embargo was lifted, uh, which just means that we uh, were able to let the news be live to everyone else. Um, in about a week, we had 31 placements. We had them in a variety of publications, which is always good to see. So we had those lifestyle publications like People and Today, Parade, Yahoo. But we also had a lot of those trade industry uh, publications like All Recipes, Tasting Table, Restaurant Business. So a lot of different perspectives on the same news, a lot of different angles, um, and a lot of excitement. So. That is so, so cool. And Erin, I didn't know that you ran PR for um, Outback. We have a little tie in there. I used to intern for their parent company, Bloomin' Brands there in Tampa. So very familiar with the brand. And that's really, really cool. Um, okay, both of you, I'm curious to hear, this is kind of a broad question, but I'm excited to hear your answers. What advice do you have for brands that are looking to land PR placements for their products just in general? Erin, how about you go first? 
So what I would say is to uh, think of what you can do for them, not what they can do for you. That's the best place to start is just by putting yourself in their shoes and getting to know them, really immersing yourself and familiarizing yourself with the media landscape, with uh, those within your industry and what co topics they're covering, uh, what the trends are right now, what's happening in the world and how your product relates to that and how you can add value. That's excellent advice. And I think also, and this is maybe a little bit of a hot take or harsh advice, but your story as a brand is probably not as interesting as you think it is. I think that, and it's great that, especially if you look at smaller companies and brands and, and even with bigger brands where you, you have, you've had marketers working there for a long time, everybody drinks the Kool-Aid and not always questions if the narrative, if your story is really interesting from a press and more importantly, from a consumer point of view. So that's the first point. You can you can have the best relationships with reporters, but if you don't have a compelling story to tell, then you don't have a lot. And I think that, you know, the hot honey example that you mentioned is fantastic because there then it's not all about you, but it's also you tying your story into something that is topical. And I think that Something that I'm seeing really becoming a huge trend in the area of PR right now is partnerships. So how can you bring in maybe another non-competing brand and work together with them and do something out of the box, you know, for, for example, Adidas partnering with Simpsons on doing that shoe where Homer Simpson is coming out of that bush, right? And that that's actually in that shoe. So uh, again, just one example of how you can bring these unexpected collaborations and bringing those to market. And, and also, I think that working with creators is a really interesting new avenue for a lot of brands to get that press. Everybody's talking about, you know, Alex Earl and the likes. And so if you're able to get into that world, I think creators are very much becoming um, they used to be looked at as a media buy, right? You're buying a placement on social with a person who has a following. And now I actually think it's more of an awareness play and it's more of a PR play uh, for a lot of brands too. Oh, I totally agree with that. And that is so topical to things that we've been talking about. Even on this show, we just had um, a couple of weeks ago, someone um, that, who's open for hire in that creator, celebrity influencer space. And then um, we also had on the media relations supervisor from McDonald's, his name is Jacob. We had him on the show earlier this year, and he was talking all about their experiences with that. Like he was able to create messaging around that uh, menu item or the Cardi B and offset menu item. And Things like that. And those are, those are just so impactful and tie into different moments that are going on in pop culture or just regular, um, you know, everyday life for people. Um, along those lines, I would love to know what do typical lead times look like for placements in different publications? So I kind of want to know the differences between um, like a small publication, a medium or large scale, and then also um, the differences between like print, you know, uh, just, you know, social media mentions or online articles and things like that. So whoever has um, a good way to sum that up, let me know. I don't think there is a, a simple way to answer that question, just because it really depends on the season, on the industry. Like, I've, I've done a lot of tech PR, a lot of agency PR, and a lot of B2B PR. And so when we are working with stories where, for example, a reporter is looking for a quote on, let's say, Meta just came out with their earnings call and they said that they're looking forward to a strong quarter. What does this mean for brands? And let's say you have a Digiday or an Adweek a reporter writing an article about it. The lead time could be as fast as you have to give us a quote within the next few hours. I've been in that situation for many times and, and then that article comes out the next day. But then if you are building out for a, you know, you're pitching, for example, your company story, let's say you're a new CPG brand, it could take three to six months just to build out that familiarity with the reporters and getting your founders in front of these reporters for informational interviews. And if they don't have a specific task to write up about a certain industry, then they're just going to fit it in whenever they feel comfortable enough or it fits in the editorial calendar. So it really, really depends on what the agenda of the publication, the reporter is, and also um, where you are in terms of overall awareness as a brand. 
Absolutely. That is, I'm so glad uh, for how you brought that to everyone's attention because it's so true. Um, and I'm glad you brought up the difference between reactive and proactive PR because that really makes such a difference in the time frame. Um, reactive is that is that joke about the PR. It's PR, not the ER kind of situation. It's going to be quick. We're going to need that quote. Uh, turnaround would be like a day, sometimes less. It can be really pretty crazy. Um, but when it's proactive and you're the one uh, reaching out for those those opportunities, um, it'll be a bit longer. I'd say for um, just so that you have something to go off of as a, as a listener, typically we aim for at least two weeks. At least two weeks lead time is what I would give my clients. So please, please, please help me help you. Let's go for at least two weeks. Um, but like you said, there's so many factors, um, not just uh, the size of the publication, I would actually more say the format. So if that's print versus broadcast or online, radio and podcast, um, also whether it's news that you're sharing under embargo, like it's secret and you have some time to work on it before it goes out there, or if it's real time, um, real time news. Uh, and even if you're looking at freelancers, say it is for online, if you're looking at freelancers versus um, standard publication. Yeah, I completely agree. Thank you for that. That's um, really important to know the differences between those different types of uh, PR, those avenues that you can take with your um, with your stories. So thanks so much for sharing that. Um, so I have a question as a lot of brands are probably thinking coming up is holiday, right? And there's a lot of buzz around holiday gift guides in the past. I've done pitching and I've been on the receiving end of tons of pitches for a media company, um, just talking about new products and, and product inclusions on things like gift guides. Um, do you have any advice for people who want to stand out, you know, in that area and how, um, how to kind of approach the timeline on that? Because mm -hmm. um, I know that people are already looking and it's August, <laughs> so. I think there's th such a discrepancy between how companies view when the holiday season starts and when it actually starts and when, when reporters start to write about it. And and especially in, in my world, in the world of like B2B and, and marketing and advertising, a lot of the agencies and tech providers and also brands, you know, you start thinking and, producing your holiday campaigns like in May, June, like getting everything ready. But reporters in the industry aren't really going to start talking about them until I want to say like October, sometimes even just like after, after Halloween. And so I think that you have to First of all, you have to be mindful of and maybe look at the, the publications, your target publications where you want to be featured in and, and see what what's the timeline. When did they start talking about it last year and who are the reporters that typically cover that? And again, um, I think it's about tying your story, not just this is a great gift, but actually tying that back into what's happening in the world and in the culture overall, like, can you pull in a TikTok trend that's really hot right now? And does your product fit into that? And will it, will it again, serve the reporter? Will it serve the consumer? And I think that's great. Um, the fact that you were bringing in that online element, um, since I know that this podcast is typically geared towards marketers, um, that's something that they can do to think uh, with a PR hat on, is thinking of how the online conversation that they're seeing and taking part in, how that can can lead to media, mm -hmm. how that then shows that your product is trending in this way or with these consumers. Um, I'd say some practical tools that you can have for uh, those gift guide opportunities that we know are coming up and so sought after uh, would be through those resources like Hero and Quoted that can bring you those opportunities. But more so even than that, I would really urge everyone, um, like we said, of doing your homework and getting to know the media landscape and who your best uh, writers would be that match up with uh, what you're looking for follow them on their Substack newsletters. That's where they're, that's where they uh, migrated to. That's where they're looking for those opportunities and welcoming um, pitches on different topics, the gift guides, um, and also on LinkedIn. Um, editorial calendars can also be helpful. That's a longer lead time. So these would be for the quicker turnarounds. Other than that, I would say, um, look at what was done last year even reach out to that person say, are you planning to replicate that this year? Because my product fits in XYZ way and really give them everything that you can 
to make their lives easier. It's always, how can I make the life easier for the media person? So if you can tie everything up with a nice bow of the photos, videos, the copy that goes along with it, that'll really increase your odds as well. And I would also add to that, you should be engineering domain authority around the the holiday and the gifting stories across your owned and operated channels. So don't just have a great story packaged up in a nice little PR pitch, but then you're not talking about it to your audience at all. You could actually be building out that story, let's say on TikTok, on your social media, through your newsletters. And so building out to that story moment. And so then when you're reaching out to your uh, to the reporters, you can link back to your, your social media or TikTok, like, hey, this is the story that we're telling around our product for the holidays. And that's also so giving the the reporting reporter something more tangible and digestible other than just a five bullet points on why your product is great for the holidays. Yeah, I also think that speaks to the fact that when you're pitching on a specific topic, making sure that when these reporters land on your own channels, as you mentioned, there's relevant information that kind of backs up those claims or information on the product or service. So that's a great piece of advice there. Um, Erin, I also love that you mentioned Harrow, which is a favorite platform of mine. And I know Erica, and we all talk about it all the time on this podcast along those lines, because Harrow is a free resource that is available to really any, uh, outlet or brand to use and to connect with potential reporters speaking on different topics that are relevant to your brand. Are there any other resources or tips that you all have for low budget PR options? Is it monitoring Twitter or X, I should say now to kind of engage in some conversations with the reporters? Do you have any tips for just low cost options for stuff like that and gaining placements? I would, unfortunately, I'm probably a broken record, but I would you know, just urge people to get to know the writers and follow them where they prefer to be followed. Um, you can even uh, actually as another free workaround, if you look up a writer and you find them on Muckrack, uh, yes, Muckrack is something that you have to pay for to actually get their email address and everything. But a lot of times you can still see um, their pitch preferences. So it'll tell you like time of day that they want to be contacted um, and different platforms to follow them on. And so reaching them there is a workaround for people um, that are just getting into the PR landscape. Uh, following them on those newsletters is where they're asking to be contacted. So that is going to be an incredible resource for everyone to take them up on that. Um, and LinkedIn as well. Uh, yes, Twitter, uh, but they also have the journal requests hashtag on LinkedIn. And I would also say that when you're reaching out, sometimes it's actually easier to get in the door through the junior staff, junior editors, junior writers, because again, they have a little bit more time on their hands than the editor in chief or the more or their managers. And so I've had success in reaching out to them first, and then they would they would put me in touch with the person actually writing or in, or in charge of deciding whether this is going to be featured or not. So that's an easy way. And then I would also say, rethink what you classify as PR. Again, you know, working at a, an influencer agency, I worked at, I work at Billion Dollar Boy, obviously I'm going to be preaching all about the creator economy, but there is truth to that. So if you think about where you first go these days, so let's say you're you're interested in trialing out a new hair product as a consumer, I don't think you're going to allure.com anymore and searching and seeing if they they've written about it. Yeah, you might Google. A lot of us go on TikTok these days and we're going to see if people are making content and doing reviews and trialing out different products there on that platform. So I would look at user-generated content as an additional support, and it can be pretty low cost, especially if you're going with um, micro with smaller influencers and creators. And that's a great way to actually also amplify your PR message. You just have to think about it in, in, in a different way, a different lens. Absolutely, because that can establish consumer demand a lot of times um, and the timely and trendiness of it, which is a big question of like, why should I care, which is uh, on the minds of all media people and their readership, why should they care? Um, so I love incorporating what's going on with marketing and social media in my pitches to give me that credibility. Um, so linking to whatever influencer work was going on or letting them know that, you know, such and such term is going viral right now on a, like search term on TikTok. Um, anything that you can do there. And I would also, I mean, any 
chance that you have for looking into reports that are going on in the industry, even like Pinterest's report of like, what's, what's the conversation and how can you join it? Um, and it's, like you said, with reaching out to maybe not always going to the editorial director, you know, diversifying who you're speaking to. Um, but even in addition to that, I would just, I would encourage everyone to approach PR with authenticity and really give a genuine compliment every once in a while. Don't, don't, don't ask for anything in return. Just tell them that I'm a reader and I really enjoyed this and this meant something to me. And if I can ever be a resource for you, let me know. Um, that is a one of those longer leads, uh, but it really makes you stand out um, and is, is a positive relationship building moment there. Fantastic. Well, you both have already kind of mentioned a couple tips around this question, but what are some additional steps that us marketers can take to help the brands we work for stand out to editors and journalists? You know, you mentioned making sure there's content, tangible creative on social to kind of back up some of these topics we're speaking to, but anything else around, you know, website content, social media content, blogs, really anything else you can speak to in terms of making sure that partnership between marketing and PR is really infused and tight knit. It's all about the value offer. And again, reporters, regardless of the industry, they love data and insights. So if you're able to bring in an original data backed angle on your product on a consumer behavior, whether it's like how, I don't know, how the types of beauty products that women are buying this season, whatever it may be. And if you're able to offer something that can help the publication or reporter write a unique story that's really going to garner the audience's in interest, I think that's something that works really well. And again, it needs to whatever data or insights you're offering always think through how it ties back into your brand story and supports it. So don't just go and commission research um, just for the sake of it, like make sure that it really supports your brand story as a whole. I just preach. I literally love that. Uh, it's a tough, it's a tough ask a lot of times to ask someone to be willing to share some kind of data point like that, but numbers get you so far. Um, so if there is something that you're proud of and you feel comfortable sharing, that will always increase your odds. Um, and then if you can't do that, a workaround, like you said, would be any kind of industry or consumer insights. People want to know what's trending. It's what makes you curious too. You're like, what What have I been learning um, through my brand? What am I seeing? Uh, why am I making some of the choices that I'm making? Am I pivoting in a really interesting way uh, that others might learn from? Um, but even, uh, you know, beyond that, I would say, ask yourselves early and often, is this newsworthy? Just, you said it earlier, and it is probably like the number one thing PR people just want to like scream from the rooftops is just not forgetting when you're in the weeds um, to take a step back every once in a while and just say, is this newsworthy and be honest with yourself and open to that answer potentially not being what you want it to be because it still gives you the opportunity to find a way to make it newsworthy. Sometimes it's adding on an influencer or partnership like you were saying that can make all the difference um, and is a nice compliment to what you've already been working on. Um, but just trying to find that story um, and you know, thinking in terms of the people that you're speaking to. I want that on a t-shirt, by the way. Literally, I work on that. Yes, t-shirts coming soon. I love it. Oh my gosh. Well, this conversation has gone by so fast, but we're so grateful to you both for all of the wonderful answers that you shared. Uh, where can listeners find you both and follow along with what you're up to? Christine, how about you go first? Sure. So you can find me obviously on LinkedIn. You can find a Christine Goose on on TikTok and and Instagram. But uh, my podcast. House of Content, it's on all of the regular podcasting platforms. We're on Spotify, we're on Apple, wherever you get your podcasts. And we are also on social media at It's House of Content. You just got to follow. For me, I would say, uh, you know, follow me on, uh, send me a, you know, a connection on LinkedIn. I love having uh, creators improve my feed there and get a experience their brilliance. Um, so my name is Erin Murphy. Check me out on LinkedIn. Otherwise, if you want more frequent updates about me and my clients, uh, you can go to at this is press on Instagram, see what my company's up to. Otherwise, it's my personal Instagram for if you want to know what happy hours I'm at. Three R-I-N Murphy uh, on Instagram. The three is a play on the cursive E.
Amazing. And we'll link everything in the show notes below so people don't have to scribble it down and they, they know where to go to just click and get right to you guys. So thanks again for joining us. This has been great.